University of Washington, where you run a lab focused on developing therapies uh, for age-associated diseases by targeting the pathways that regulate aging. And uh, that seems to involve a lot of work with rapamycin, uh, which is great. So it's great to have you back on the channel. And thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. So, Dr. Cablin, so if we start by talking about rapamycin, because I I think that that is a um, intervention that you work with a lot. Um, And so I do want to talk about how we can actually get it more more widely used. But um, you did, there was a paper that uh, you recently published, or or at least you, you were an author on, which was related to people using rapamycin in an off-label way with, uh, right. I believe, with, with their doctor, right? It, it, they, their doctor had to be involved in that. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that paper? I mean, what kind of results did you see? Um, what kind of dose was most people using? Sure, yeah. So just to, to set the stage, um, it is it, it, the, the study was designed really to collect data from, as you said, um, individuals who have been using rapamycin, what's called off-label. And, and really what that means is that rapamycin has been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration for certain indications like use in organ transplant patients, use in cardiac stents, certain forms of cancer, a few rare genetic diseases. And off-label simply, and those are the label uses of rapamycin, off-label simply means the use of an approved drug for any other use that is not what it's approved for. And that's legal in the United States and in many other countries around the world with the prescription of a a licensed medical provider. Now, I go through that because because what you said isn't quite correct in the sense that we did not require that the people who participated in our study were using rapamycin uh, under the guidance of a a physician. And we didn't do that for a couple of reasons. One is we didn't have any way to validate that. It would have required some complications with medical privacy for people to prove that they had a prescription on our end. Um, And second, we really wanted to understand what was happening out there in the real world. And we certainly knew that some people are, are in fact using rapamycin and other pharmaceutical medications without the prescription of a doctor. That's just the reality of this, of the situation. So we collected data from all of those, all of those individuals. We did ask them whether they were using rapamycin under the guidance of a physician. And the vast majority of the people who completed our, our study um, answered that they were. That's the other piece I want to just, just mention up front is one of the limitations to this study is it's all patient reported, right? Or participant mm-hmm. reported. So all of the data we collected is really coming from what they tell us. We didn't go back and laboratory confirm any of the information or or, or, or require that people submit medical records, things like that. So this is a survey-based study mm-hmm. of participant reported outcomes. Now, the way this was designed is it, it wasn't limited to only people who were using rapamycin off-label. We also collected data from people who had never used rapamycin. So we really ended up with two groups of, of individuals. We had, I think, 333 people who had, had previously used rapamycin. And then a, it was a hundred and something. I should remember. I don't remember off the top of my head, but but it was a it was it was more than a hundred people who had never used rapamycin. And so we kind of grouped people into those those groups of rapamycin users and rapamycin non-users, and asked them a whole bunch of questions about their experiences taking rapamycin, including um, side effects that they may have experienced and their perceptions of of the drug. Lots of demographic information, and then we also. Um, did a little bit of a deeper dive on COVID-19 outcomes. Right. And kind of what did you see? Uh, did, I mean, did you see any differences between those taking rapamycin and those not? Yeah. So the, the things that I can could point to, I think there were really two, two primary um, uh, things that came out of this study that I feel pretty confident about. Again, given the limitations of the study, right, you have to be a little bit cautious in how you interpret the, the data. Um, one of the main things we were hoping to understand is whether or not in people using rapamycin off-label, there is a significantly higher prevalence of potential side effects that we might um, expect to see in people using rapamycin based on data from organ transplant patients, because that's by by large the, the, the largest um, group of uh, patients where rapamycin has been used in a clinical setting. And so we had a list of about, I think, 40 
potential side effects. Um, and the question was framed in the way where we asked in the last three months, have you experienced this particular side effect? So that included things like gastrointestinal upset, you know, various pain in various parts of the body, mouth sores. Um, uh, and there were, like I said, there were about 40 of these things. And the, the two groups that we compared were people who had never used rapamycin or people who had been using rapamycin for at least through that last three month period. So they had to have been using rapamycin for that entire period. And the interesting thing there was there was only one potential side effect that was statistically significantly higher in the people using rapamycin versus the, the non-users, and that was mouth sores. And that makes sense. And in some ways that was reassuring because that is by far the most common side effect that organ transplant patients experience. And, um, and so that was the thing we anticipated that should come out of this study. And it did. And it was about, I think it was about 15% of the rapamycin users that reported having had these canker sores in the last three months. And that actually matches up very well with um, what has been seen in prior studies with rapamycin or a rapamycin derivative called Everolimus at comparable doses over about the same time period. So, so it was actually really quite reassuring to see that. Nothing else was overrepresented in the rapamycin users group. The other thing that was interesting about that was there were six other you know, potential side effects that were actually less frequent in the rapamycin users, statistically significantly less frequent in the rapamycin users compared to the non-users. Now that I want to be a little bit more cautious about um, interpreting too strongly, but they're potentially interesting. Some things like uh, pain in, in uh, the, the stomach or gastrointestinal upset, which was surprising because we expected, if anything, that would be higher in the rapamycin users. And then some things that I think are pretty interesting and worthy of, of additional study like anxiety and depression. And the reason why I, I say that that's interesting is there's accumulating data um, for conditions like autism or uh, other uh, evidence that rapamycin does in fact impact brain chemistry. In fact, there's this whole burgeoning, it's very small, but growing area of research on rapamycin in combination with ketamine for things like chronic pain or chronic depression. So it's clear that rapamycin and then the, the protein that rapamycin inhibits, which is mTOR, impact the brain in ways that we don't understand. And, and so it wouldn't surprise me if those effects are actually real, but again, it, it requires more research. But I thought that was interesting that that came out that anxiety and depression were significantly, again, self-reported significantly lower in the rapamycin user group compared to the non-user group. So that was one piece from the study that we learned. The other piece that was pretty interesting had to do with COVID-19. And I won't take you through the entire story other than to say that, um, among the rapamycin users, if you think about a COVID-19 infection, we asked everybody, "Have you? did you experience a COVID-19 infection? There was no difference between non-users and users in frequency of COVID-19 infection. So no evidence that rapamycin use affects risk of an infection with COVID-19 uh, overall. What was interesting was the people who had used rapamycin continuously before, during, and after their COVID-19 infection were statistically significantly less likely to have experienced a moderate or severe infection as opposed to a mild infection, and significantly less likely to have self-reported ongoing symptoms, which, which we would consider consistent with long COVID. So again, suggestive maybe that rapamycin use in that context is protective against more severe infections mm -hmm. and persistence of symptoms of COVID-19. And again, that requires obviously a, a more research and double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials to really feel confident about, but there's reason to believe. It kind of makes sense with the way that rapamycin works. In fact, there have been a few papers that have been published suggesting that rapamycin might actually be useful in the context of the COVID-19 inflammatory response and cytokine storm. And I would say our data are you know, consistent with that. Although again, you really want to want to see the double blind placebo controlled clinical trials to, to nail that down for sure. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I mean, I don't suppose you can comment on whether it would work kind of post hoc on um, long COVID. So I don't, I mean, I can't comment in the sense that I don't have any data. I can speculate right. and I have speculated <laughs> um, that in fact, yes, I think there's a pretty good chance that rapamycin would be beneficial in some people, at least with, with long COVID. And I guess that's the other piece I would say from our study. Um, I think we can say with some growing degree of confidence that at least 
you know, short-term use of rapamycin in the dose ranges that are typically used off-label is pretty safe. There's no real evidence for side effects, um, at least over a period of several months. Now, again, you know, who knows if you were to take rapamycin off-label for many years, maybe there would have uncover some side effects that 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 we haven't seen. But I, I think it's pre- I think we can be pretty confident that the risk associated with low dose use of rapamycin, at least in the short term, is pretty low. And certainly our study suggests that. And so, yeah, I think that there is a pretty good rationale for testing whether rapamycin in people who have long COVID can help alleviate some of those symptoms. And again, based on what I know. I would suggest that you probably would see effects within about a three to six month time period. So it doesn't require a long time to actually do some of these studies to, to find out. And I think there's an opportunity to maybe help a lot of people who, you know, really are still struggling, sadly, still struggling, you know, with just their, their daily lives because they've got these ongoing symptoms. So you mentioned dose with uh, what dose were the was most common? Yeah. So the most common dose was six milligrams once a week orally. Um, But I will say there was quite a big distribution. So, you know, I think at the high end, there were one or two people who were up around 20 milligrams once a week. There were quite a few people who were doing, you know, one to two milligrams once a week. There were certainly some people who were doing daily dosing with rapamycin. So there was a pretty big spread in the doses that people were using, but, but clearly the most common dose was right around five or six milligrams once a week. Sleep is the key to your body's rejuvenation and repair process. It controls hunger and weight loss hormones, boosts energy levels, and impacts countless other vital functions. During the holiday season, it's easy to slip from our health routine and have more late nights and eat irregularly. In fact, drinking more than two servings of alcohol per day for men and more than one for women can decrease sleep quality by 39.2%, according to a study from Tampere University in Finland. But when the vacation season winds down, it's time to get back on track and focus on healthy eating, exercise, and above all, quality sleep. For my sleep, I take Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers because it contains all seven forms of magnesium. I take it every evening and it helps me fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Visit magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash modern and enter code 10 for 10% off your order of Magnesium Breakthrough. Thank you for your support. Let's see that the Lamming Lab, so so Dr. Lamming is at least on rapamycinnews.com, is looking for people for an, for another similar, I um I, I guess similar trial. Have you have you seen that? Or have any comment on so, that? So uh, so I if I if I know if I if the if you're referring to the study that I'm aware of that that Dudley is um involved in, I think what they're doing there is actually looking for changes in circulating metabolites in people mm. who are using rapamycin off-label. So slightly different uh, outcome that they're looking at, but but similar kind of question. Yes. So, so, so people who are using rapamycin off-label and trying to understand, can we see differences in lipid metabolism or other, other types of metabolic responses? And again, there's, there's, there's data in preclinical studies in mice in particular showing that um, at least at higher doses, rapamycin can have pretty potent effects both on lipid metabolism and uh, glucose metabolism. And so it make it makes sense to look in in people using rapamycin off label and see if you can you can detect any patterns there. I think that's what that study is looking for. Right. Yes, I think so. That was it because they are looking for a blood draw. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, right. Yeah, with that. Okay. So I have heard, and I should have found the reference that. Um, rapamycin may have a negative impact impact on memory. It's been seen in mice in in uh, hip, hippocampus. Um, right. are, are you aware of that? And do you have any comment yeah. on it? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think this is true of any drug. Dose makes the poison. So, mm-hmm. what we know, and this is, and so, so one of the things that people should understand about rapamycin. It's an inhibitor of a protein called mTOR. Actually, mTOR actually stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. So, mTOR is I think it's fair to say, even though I'm an mTOR fanboy, I think anybody who understands cell biology would agree with this. mTOR is one of the most critical proteins in a cell in the sense that it is centrally involved in pretty much everything that needs to happen for a cell to grow. And because that's true, if you inhibit mTOR enough, you can impair just about any fundamental 
process that cells have to carry out, including synthesis of new proteins, which is kind of central to everything a cell needs to do. So it is absolutely true that if you take if you treat a cell with enough rapamycin, you turn mTOR down far enough, you will impair many, many processes, mm -hmm. including things like synthesis of new proteins, which then results at the tissue level in an inability to make new muscle, make new memories for the cell to divide. So that's the context for the learning and memory um, studies is you need synthesis of new proteins for the formation of new memories. And if you inhibit mTOR enough, you block the synthesis of new proteins and impair memory formation. So that is absolutely true. I think it's important to understand the doses of rapamycin that would do that in a human would almost certainly be incompatible with life. So I don't think there's any reason to believe that the doses that people are taking of rapamycin have a negative impact on memory formation. Certainly no data to support that. And in mice, what we've seen is that the doses of rapamycin that increase lifespan and appear to slow many different aspects of aging from a functional or disease perspective actually preserve memory during aging, prevent age-related onset of dementia. And in multiple Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, tauopathy models actually protect against brain degeneration, neurodegeneration. So I would say if anything, and again, no real data for this yet in people, but if anything, we would actually expect rapamycin to do the opposite in terms of mm -hmm. memory formation and be protective against memory loss. Um, but again, I think we really need to collect the human data to, to draw any definitive conclusions. But if you were just to base it on the mouse studies at the doses that we're talking about that people would be taking, we would actually expect a memory preservation, cognitive function preservation effect, as opposed to impaired memory formation. Cool. So speaking of kind of human trials, how, I mean, how do you see, rap we've known rapamycin has uh, extended lifespan in mammals for decade and a half right now, something like that, for a long time. Um, I mean, how do you see that we could make this more recommended, generally available? So, you know, these trials are showing that you can get to rapamycin if you really want to, if you want to take right. responsibility for it yourself. But right. um, for it to be recommended as a kind of life extension drug, I, I mean, A, do you think that would be a good idea? And B, um, can I, how could we get that? Yeah. So I don't know if it'd be a good idea because I can't say with 100% confidence that it actually works, right, for, right. for that purpose. So, so what I would say is, um, I think there's, there's, there's probably two paths, at least, that this realistically could, could have, how this could happen. The best path, which I think is unlikely to be what actually happens, is somebody funds the definitive clinical trials to actually prove whether or not rapamycin can impact all of the different age-related functional declines and diseases, or at least some of them that we know it does in mice, whether it can have those same effects in people. Those clinical trials are doable, but there is so far very little appetite for somebody to fund those trials. And we could talk about why. I think the largest reason is because rapamycin has been off patent for a long time. There is not the financial incentive for somebody to fund the definitive clinical trials. So that's a, that's a barrier. The other barrier is that because of the way rapamycin was de developed as an organ transplant drug, it would be used in a certain relatively sick patient population at high doses. In that context, it was attributed to, uh, to have many side effects. Now, even that's a little bit weak, but it is at least the perception among regulators and among some clinicians that rapamycin has a long list of side effects. And so it has sort of a bad reputation. And that is a barrier that makes it difficult for people who, even if you had the funding for a clinical trial, there's lots of bureaucratic hoops you have to jump through to convince FDA to, to give you a new drug designation and, and do the clinical trial. So there's a bureaucratic... So there's a financial barrier mm -hmm. and a bureaucratic barrier that so far have made it very challenging for people to do these kinds of clinical trials. That's what we would like to see. I hope that happens. I, 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 we'll, we'll see. I, I hope it happens. Um, I think the other path is kind of what is happening now. And again, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent about this because I'm not positive that this is necessarily a completely good thing, but mm -hmm. there is a percol percolating and growing perception, which 
that number one, rapamycin off-label use is pretty safe. That I think is probably true. And number two, that rapamycin might help people live longer and healthier. I also think that's true, but I think a lot of people lose the, the might part and they just, they, they believe <laughs> that it's going to do this. And so they expect it to do that. That we don't know, but there is this growing sort of buzz uh, that more and more people are now taking rapamycin off-label. I think if rapamycin continues to prove to be relatively safe, and people start to, to accumulate evidence, which is never gonna be as strong from that sort of off-label use. But I think over time, you can in fact accumulate sufficient evidence for the perception, broadly speaking, to change that rapamycin has some benefits. And we'll just have to wait and see if that happens. So that to me seems like a more likely path and time will tell, you know, uh, uh, what the sort of perception is. I think the problem, my concern with that path is that so much of it is about perception and it's less about data. And, you know, I'm a very data driven person. And so my worry is that the perception will end up being different than the actual data. And that could be, that could go either way. The perception could be that rapamycin is this great drug that's, you know, going to make people live longer. Suddenly everybody starts taking it. And that turns out not to be the case, or it could be the case that rapamycin actually is helping a lot of people, but there's one bad outcome somebody gets sick and dies and it gets blamed on rapamycin. And then the perception is that rapamycin killed this person. So that's the problem with the kind of off-label use biohacker sort of um, uh, approach that, that seems to be popular right now is the perception isn't necessarily going to match up with reality. And really the only way to get a, a a, a ground truth is a really well conducted double blind placebo controlled trial. So, so, you know, I think hopefully where we'll end up is somewhere in the middle, we'll get some mm -hmm. clinical trial data, we'll get some real world, you know, off label use data, and it'll all kind of, you know, match up, and then we can have some confidence. And, and again, the other thing people should recognize is, in all of this, in any clinical, in any clinical, uh, use paradigm that we're talking about, or even we're going to talk about lifestyle modifications later, even lifestyle modifications. There's a probabilistic component to, to these things. There is nothing, almost nothing that is a hundred percent rock solid certain that it's going to work for you. There's a probabilistic component, risk reward component that, um, you know, I think a lot of people aren't comfortable with that idea, but, but over time we gain more and more confidence, hopefully, <laughs> that what we believe is the case is actually the case based on the data. And so, so we'll just have to kind of wait and see how it comes out. I know that was sort of a long-winded answer, but mm. but part of the part of the challenge is that there is not there's not clarity right now about how things are going to play out with with rapamycin and um, and whether it's going to be a collection of anecdotal n of one experiments or you know really good well-designed clinical trials. Mm -hmm.